This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 3. This week, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Aaron Vernalis joins me to describe the clothing and equipment FA-18 aircrew wear in flight. Go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat. My name is Vincent Aiello. I am your host. And I tell you what, I am just floored by the response this show has received since launching on January 1st, 2018. We've had over a thousand downloads in the first few days. Social media sites have been abuzz. And even my fellow fighter pilots have been fairly generous. You know, they can be a pretty tough crowd. But a lot of them have reached out and said they think it's a good idea and given me suggestions and pointers already. So I think we're going to keep this thing going. In fact, I don't think two shows a month is going to be enough. So I'm going to try three times a month for the time being. And today, as I mentioned in the little teaser there, we're going to talk flight clothing and flight equipment with my buddy Aaron Vernalis. He and I had a lot to cover. Our interview ends up lasting just over 40 minutes. So in the interest of keeping the rest of this episode on schedule... Let's go ahead and jump straight into our question and answer segment. Now, my first question comes from Robert in Ames, Iowa. And I should mention that Robert is a friend of mine. We actually met through podcasting. He has the musclecarplace.com and a couple shows on iTunes. And you should go over and check those out if you're into muscle cars at all. But I am. And I reached out to him a few years ago and we struck up a friendship and Robert became hugely instrumental in the launching of this show. So publicly, Robert, thanks for your help. And here's his question. In episode one, Sunshine mentions the three different methods of becoming a commissioned officer, service academy, ROTC, and officer candidate school. And these are the prerequisites of becoming a pilot. I've always wondered, when it comes to fighter selection, does the track one took have a bearing on who ends up getting a fighter? Meaning, is performance in flight school the only evaluation, or does officer track background play a factor? Well, Robert, unless things have changed since when I went through, the answer is yes, performance in flight school is the only evaluation, and no, officer track background does not play a factor. I mean, it really just comes down to your academic performance. Maybe a little bit as well on some of the physical evaluations they do, as well as your performance in water survival, but it really comes down to your performance. Now, that being said, you know, the selection academies, or the service academies, I should say, are very selective. They can afford to choose from among the cream of the crop of their uh, applicants. And so you end up with a pool of people who are highly talented. And I would think that probably correlates to better performance in flight school, but I don't think that's causation. You know, I tried to get into the Naval Academy, and frankly, I was not accepted. But I went through ROTC and worked hard and worked hard in uh, flight school as well. So you can make it, and I don't think they hold it against you where you come from. Now, in regards to your follow-on question, do I know anyone who went through OCS who's a fighter pilot? Well, the answer to that is no, but that's not because it never happened. It's just because in my limited mental capacity, I just can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but I'm sure I have several friends that have been through OCS and uh, went on to become fighter pilots. So great question, but no, I believe it all comes down to performance. My second question comes from Gareth in the United Kingdom, who asks, did you ever experience any failures with your flight gear that could have jeopardized you or your mission? And secondly, I've noticed that some pilots fly wearing gloves and some without, and some with the ends of the fingers cut off. What was your preference and why? Well, Gareth, those are two excellent questions that will lead us nicely into our discussion today on flight equipment, because I address both of those in the course of my discussion with Vern. So sit tight and you'll get your answers. Uh, But before we get to the interview, I just want to take a better stab, if you will, at an analogy I made to explain what a carrier air wing is. In the interview, you're going to hear me make some lame attempt at comparing it to a football league. And that, that just fell flat. I couldn't edit it out cleanly. So let me instead say a carrier air wing is an aviation organization that's made up of up to about eight or so squadrons. Now, in a typical carrier air wing, you'll generally have about four F-18 squadrons. You might have two helicopter squadrons, and then you have two other squadrons of aircraft that uh, serve in various capacities. 
They may all be based in different places, but when it's time to deploy on an aircraft carrier, they all come together and go out as one team under the leadership of one air wing commander. So that's why I didn't really like later when I listened to my analogy of a football league because those teams are all playing each other. But when a carrier air wing goes out, it's all one team. All right, that'll do it for the Q&A segment this week. Let's get to the interview. Vern, what's up, man? Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Thanks, Jello. Uh, glad to be here. Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please meet my friend, U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Aaron Vernalis. I think we name-dropped you on episode two, so they're a little bit familiar with the name at least, but why don't you give us a quick background, if you would, on where you're from, where you went to school, and what your professional career has been like. Well, Jello, I was born in uh, Oakland, California, but was the son of a, uh, a Navy F-4 pilot. So we tended to move around a bit, spent some time in Virginia Beach growing up, and then Washington, D.C., and then found myself to uh, Ventura, California. Once I grew up out there, my, my father ended up retiring, flying uh, F-4s 30 years after he started in Point Magoo, and I guess it just got in my blood. Ended up uh, joining up myself, going to OCS, did API down there in Pensacola, and worked my way through to F-18s in Lemoore. I've been flying them for about 15 years now with a stint with VFA-2, did some operational tests with VX-9 out in China Lake, and then uh, did a uh, CAG-14 uh, staff tour with them to a Afghanistan deployment and followed it up with an instructor tour and then uh, did a uh, fact tour with the SEAL teams, which was a pretty interesting uh, opportunity to see things from the ground instead of being in the air and calling in the strikes from the other side. And then uh, finally ended up here at the depot uh, flying F-18s that are going through... Um, an overhaul, or, essentially, right? Yeah, an overhaul. Yeah, sure. So they're going through overhauls that take about 2,000 to 3,000 days from they get done before they go back into the air again. And then we test fly them just like how you knew, because uh, you were here for uh, the, the previous three years. That's where right. I showed up. That's where we met. Uh, I think you glossed over it. Where'd you go to college? Went to uh, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Oh, cool. Yeah, I grew up not far from there, Raw Grandy. All so, right. Uh, yeah, that's a good place. Uh, yeah, like my, my in-laws are still up there, so... Okay, uh, and then just so, you know, I actually forgot to tell you this at the beginning, but we'll just do it right now with everybody listening. Um, so some of our audience may not be as familiar with some of the terms that we, you and I use every day or used to in my case. Uh, so for those who are listening, when he said CAG uh, 14, I believe he said that. So that's the carrier air group. It's kind of old terminology, but it just means the, um, the you know, like the league, if you will, for all the teams that are within it. So it's an air wing that's made up of the squadrons uh, that are within it. And then when you said you were a FAC, that means forward air controller, right? So, That's correct. So you were on the ground. So theoretically, as a pilot, you were on the ground calling a guy like me maybe in to put bombs where they need to be. And, uh, that's you're that's right correct. There uh, JTAC's another terminology okay. for it, which is joint, joint, joint terminal attack controller. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, today the subject, as you know, is flight gear and flight equipment and flight clothing. I think we're just going to summarize it by saying flight gear. So hopefully everyone will understand what that means. And uh, we're going to work from the inside out. So when you're getting ready in the morning, uh, first thing you're starting off with is undergarments. And those generally need to be cotton. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, mainly for the, uh, the the danger that a polyester type uh, material could uh, present if it did catch on fire, could melt to the skin and, and cause more damage. And that's really, you know, let's step back even. Uh, flight gear, it, it really has kind of a couple purposes and, and fire protection is one of them, right? That's that's correct. I mean, pretty much everything that we wear um, has been written in, um, from, uh, in blood from previous experiences. It's going all the way back to the first time that they, they flew an aircraft off of, a, off of a boat. So we're looking for fire protection. We're looking for items that will keep us floating in the ocean. We're looking for items that will keep us attached to our parachute, survival items. Everything that we wear from the ground up is pretty much set to keep us alive. Sure. So fire retardancy, survival, and again, just to explain an expression that may not be totally familiar with people, written in blood simply means someone probably died. And we learned that, gee, these flight suits really need to be fire retardant. That's so, correct. Uh, uh, and that's the case. Okay. So you've got cotton. You don't want any kind of crazy materials that could melt uh, if you were in, exposed to a fire. Now, if you're in a fire, uh, you're already in trouble anyway. We're just trying to minimize the damage, right? That's correct. Okay. And especially, you know, as I've said all along, this show is somewhat Navy-centric. So we're going to talk aircraft carriers and, uh, and, and water, uh, you know, Air Force guys fly over the water, but for us, it's a, it's a big deal because we spend most of our career around, at least operationally. And so uh, fire on a carrier is about the worst possible 
thing you can have. And if you find yourself in one, you want to be at least a little bit protected, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. So after you've got those basics on, then uh, you throw on uh, what we call a flight suit. Right. Uh, so the flight suit's pretty much, you know, it's like a big set of pajamas, as my kids call it. Uh, you pretty much get to wear them around all day. Um, but they're made out of Nomex, which is a fireproof material. So the reason why we wear these flight suits and the reason why they're one piece is so that the fire can't get uh, underneath the uh, the fireproof material and end up burning the skin underneath. So the theory is, is that you have your gloves on, you got your flight suit on, and you're pretty much covered from the neck all the way down. Uh, to your fingertips and down to your down to your boots to be protected from the fire as much as possible. So if I had you hold out your arm right now and I threw a just a regular lighter under your arm, it, it doesn't dispel the heat, right? You're still going to feel that heat inside, and it could do some cellular exactly. damage. Exactly. I mean, there's there's obviously a, there's a flash point where it will burn uh, at some or char, point. Char, I think. Right? But exactly, mm-hmm. we'll kind of char and break away. But the number one thing it's it's fire retardant, uh, so it it will uh, give you that little a little bit of extra. Time, say, if, compared to if you're wearing just a cotton material on the outside or if you're wearing some kind of polyester that might melt. So it's going to give you that extra time and that extra survivability in that fire. Right. So you're not going to survive a nuclear blast, but uh, you might do okay in a fire. Right, exactly. Okay. Uh, what colors are they generally coming? Uh, they're usually green is the normal fleet standard. Um, but however, for the Navy, uh, if you're going over to the 5th uh, the Fleet AOR, which is basically the Middle East is okay. what we, we call that area. Area of responsibility, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, then you're going to tend to, to change into the tan ones. So okay. green or tan are the, pretty much the two two main colors. Now, I've seen orange, and I don't know if that's Coast Guard or Hilo guys or uh, I don't know who. Some Maybe Search and Rescue sometimes will wear an orange flight suit. Have you ever seen that yeah, one? They, I think the Coast Guard tends to wear those a little bit. But uh, going back to you know the fleet days... Um, I, I, they've gone away a little bit, but the uh, the flight suits that we would wear to the officers' club, uh, some of the squadrons would have ones that would be certain colors. So the Black Knights had black ones that they would mm-hmm. wear, for instance, and then the uh, the Red Cox, the VFA twenty two, they had their their bright red ones. as Bright well. red ones, but that was a sight. Oh yeah, and uh, I think I've seen blue ones. Of course, the Blue Angels wear the blue ones, and um, and now you said one piece and. Yeah, by the way, since retiring, I do miss the just getting up in the morning and throwing on a flight suit. It's super easy. It's fast. It's comfortable. You know, uh, the helicopter community, I think, has some two-piece. They do. Uh, and I'm not sure. Is there some advantage to that, or are you aware? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, well, there must be some reason they do it. Uh, maybe just to be different, but I guess we should have done our research, or I should have before I brought it up. But there are some two-piece flight suits out there. Okay, and then on the flight suit itself, you've got a bunch of pockets, and that's presumably to carry things. You've got Velcro, so you can attach... Uh, insignia from where you've been and what you do. In your case, you've got an American flag and a uh, F-18 patch and your name tag and the command you're at right now. And then there you got pockets. And so what's on the, your left sh- uh, sleeve there or shoulder? Uh, what Just a pen pocket? Yeah, you got uh, basically a pen pocket and then a, uh, a side pocket. So the side pocket works out really good for, for carrying earplugs uh, and mission um mission cards that we uh, use in the aircraft. Mm-hmm. So it can fit smaller items about the size of a, of a wallet uh, or smaller in and there. And almost a deck of cards, but like one yeah, card. Yeah, a deck kind of, of thing. card yeah. type of thing. Okay. And then uh, on the outside of that, you've got your your two um, storage areas for pens, a pen or a pencil. Uh, there's a flap that goes over the top of that. It's kind of the funny thing is the Navy guys, we tend to keep the flap on there. For some reason, the Air Force guys, they cut it off as soon as they uh, get an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Maybe so, they just want to be different. I, I think they use the Velcro at the bottom, actually, for uh, for fun oh, meter little, patches yeah, and stuff a little, like that. Yeah, so. uh, a little small patch or something. Exactly. Okay. Well, what happens for the left-handed guys? Do they? Have, there's no. There's no similar. Uh, pocket on the right sleeve. I, I guess they just got to learn to use the right hand, too. Uh, all right. Well, same thing with the flight controls a lot of times and everything else. Sorry, left-handed folks. Okay. Uh, so next thing you're going to put on are your boots. Yep. So uh, the boots that we have, uh, they have to be steel-toed. Uh, they're issued to us, and they're they're leather, and they go up to about the a uh, little bit above the uh, mid-ankle. Uh, the purpose of the boots is obviously uh, during an ejection. On the way out, your feet could, could very, very possibly hit something. So that's why the steel toe is there to try and protect your uh, your toes, as well as being on the flight deck, you got to have steel toes just in case you get run over by anything out there or something gets dropped on it. Uh, the other part of it is you want to have that good support because you are coming down with a parachute, but the parachutes that are in these ejection seats, it's about the equivalent of jumping off of a uh, one-and-a-half-story building. So you have to do what, uh, what's called a, a PLF. It's basically a rotation when parachute you Parachute landing fall, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you're going to break the fall as you land, and the ankle is very susceptible to, to rolling in that case. So you have to have some nice sturdy boots for that. that uh, 
So they're like a standard, in a way, work boot that uh, people might be able to buy over the counter. It's got the steel toe reinforcement, like you said, and uh, laces up a little ways, and it's that, made. That's out of correct. Leather. Yeah, I mean the the contractor that that's building them now is is basically a, a contractor that builds them for most uh, um, most working purposes out there. Okay, how about colors for those? Well, uh, traditionally, uh, going back, you, you just had uh, the black ones are being issued, and then as a uh, aviator would get winged. Uh, they would be issued brown ones. Now, where that comes from is the brown shoe navy. So we have the black shoes, which are the surface warfare officers, the SWOs, as we call them. They tend to wear the black ones, where uh, with our khakis, when we wear our uniform, uh, we'll wear brown shoes with with that uniform. Well, we we, uh, tend to do that also with the flight boots. So most of the guys you see helicopter... Uh, and fixed wing all together tend to wear the brown shoes. Mm. Um, I know up at uh, Top Gun, though, those guys still wear the black ones up there. They do. Right? I don't know if that's tradition or what, but I'll tell you, when I first came in, black was all there was, so I'm probably dating myself. And then I did go to Top Gun, and we wore black. And I've never worn brown. I hate to admit it. I went all the way through almost a quarter of a century in black, and I'd get teased a little bit here and there, but it just looked okay to me, and they were comfortable enough, so... I just wore them, but yeah, brown is fleet standard, I would say. One, one thing I did hear about uh, Top Gun wearing the black ones was that the Marines at the time weren't wearing brown ones, and since there were Marines there, they all wanted to be very uniform, oh, so sure. they would wear the black, but the funny part now is that all the uh, the Miramar Marines that I see were wearing brown. So. <laughs> well, hey, you got to evolve, right? Okay, so we've got our boots on. Now you're ready to pretty much run around. One thing we didn't talk about on the flight seat is it also has your military rank. So at this point, you can go out in town if you need to, civilian-type places, and get something quick. You're not supposed to lounge around at restaurants and whatnot, but you can, you've can. you got your rank, you've got your name, you can wear a hat or a cover, as we say in the military, and that is a working uniform similar to a pair of fatigues or camouflage or, like you said earlier, the khakis, that's that tan you know, kind of just everyday office uniform, but it, it is now your uniform. That, that's correct. So going back to, to my dad's day, um, they actually had to wear khakis just to get in the gate. You were not allowed to come into the, uh, the gate of a base wearing, wearing Kicking a flight butts, suit. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so, I mean, that's where you get a lot of the old timers see, uh, see us out in town. Um, it, they did change it. It used to be, you could only stop at a gas station, you know, to and from work. Pick or, up kids. Yeah. Pick up kids, things that, that, you know, needed to be done very quickly, but they've changed it now where the flight suit is a working uniform. So it does mean you can can go out. You can get lunch, um, you know, during during normal working hours. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to to go to a bar or drink anything like no. that. But you know, because it is it's a working uniform and it's not a dress uniform. So gotcha. two different uh, type of things there. All right. So that is what you wear every day. And if you're lucky to be flying that particular day, then once you've done all the preparation for the flight, which we won't go into here, uh, and it's time to get dressed, you go to what we call the PR shop, parachute riggers, right? Uh, That's Marines call it flight equipment. And what's the first thing you're going to put on? All right. So you already have the flight suit on that we uh, previously talked about. So uh, the first thing you're going to put on is going to be the G suit. Okay. So we have one right here. We're going to, we're going to do a little video by the way later and show it, but uh, we've got one here just to remind ourselves in case we forget uh, what all is on it. But okay. So here's a G suit. looks kind of Weird. It's like in almost three different directions, like the letter Y. Yeah. Um, kind of way to envision is, I mean, it, it looks pretty much like a cowboy's, uh, you know, chaps that he would wear. So it, it wraps around your waist, um, and then basically you, you zip it on through and you connect it at that point. And then it's going to uh, go on to both parts of the legs, and it's going to zip down uh, on the uh, inner thigh, uh, basically down from the inner thigh down to the ankle. And what you want to have is you want to have a nice secure fit with it. What this is designed to do uh, is the G forces in the aircraft when we when we pull G's, and you're pulling up to about 7.6 G's in a Hornet uh, when you're doing a max pull. So what happens is that 7.6 times the the weight of your body going basically down to the floor. Um, so your blood uh, that is normally up in your brain is going to basically get pushed down into your feet. And so the fight to stay awake uh, is is basically fighting those G's. You need to try to keep that blood up and up back in your brain. Otherwise, your brain will uh, end up becoming void of blood, and then you'll end up with a G lock. So what the G suit does is it gets you an a extra one and a half G's of tolerance of when you're pulling that G. So if you're pulling four G's or five G's that day, and you're not really straining against it to keep the the blood back in your head. That, that G suit's going to give you an extra one and a half over that. So it's going to make it a little bit easier on you to be able to fly and maneuver the aircraft. Right. So G lock, as you called it, uh, G loss of consciousness. So obviously, I think our listening audience hopefully knows that you need 
blood in your brain to function, especially at a higher level, like piloting a high performance this aircraft. Is true. This is and true. if it leaves, then you're in trouble. So the G suit uh, plugs into the airplane, right? It works off of pneumatic air uh, from the engine or somewhere. That's that's correct. It's, uh, it yeah, it's inf- basically bleed air that's uh, funneled through. And then as you start to pull more Gs, it pu- puts more air into the bladder which mm-hmm. is in the G-suit, and then that pushes um, against the uh, the legs and against the abdomen. So similar to the old school toothpaste tube, you squeeze it from the bottom and the toothpaste comes out the top. In this case, your head is the cap and the toothpaste comes out as the blood going up into the brain, and that's a good thing. Yeah. So it's exactly. got some pockets on it. fits nice and snug. Pockets are just pretty ubiquitous in everything we do, just places to keep things that you might need. Although the nice thing about these is it, you know, your flight suit pockets, except for the one on your shoulder that you described, everything else is pretty much covered once you're fully dressed. So these are ones you can get access to when you go. And then on super long flights, you can actually use this. There's a test button that makes sure it works and you can almost use it as a little mini massage, right? You can inflate it and deflate it and kind of so, I mean, if you're sitting in that jet, it's not like being on an airliner where you can get up and go to the restroom. You're you're stuck in that airplane possibly for a, up up to eight hours. Uh, what was your longest mission? Uh, it was probably about seven, seven, seven wow. hours. I don't think I went over six and a half, but you're not moving out of that seat. So you can you can inflate this thing. And it yeah, gives it helped you a get little, some, some blood moving yeah, through the legs Yeah, get the blood again. moving around a little bit. And then if you ever find yourself, God forbid, in a survival situation in the water, this thing can also be used for flotation. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, if you if you need to, we have other primary um, uh, flotation devices that we'll yep. talk about later. Right. But but that's one thing they teach you is that you can blow it up and put some air in there, and that will help you float. Cool. Now it'll help. Hopefully your... not upside down. But... Yeah. Right. That's what I was about to say. Is it'll help your legs float. <laughs> but all right. Uh, let's see. Let's get this thing out of the way. That's the G suit. Uh, what do we got after that? Well, uh, so we've got basically the survival vest with the uh, the harness. Mine's integrated, um, so there's there's kind of two different setups they could have out there. You could have the survival vest uh, that's attached from it, um, or in my case, basically all my pockets are sewed directly onto the uh, the torso harness. All right, so let's just talk about the torso harness itself for starters. What 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 is the purpose of a torso harness? Well, you can kind of look at the torso harness as being a, a seat belt that you you wear on on yourself. Uh, if you think about a sky jumper, you know he he's jumping out. He's got to have that parachute attached to something. Um, that's more or less what what the uh, the torsion harness does is it, it attaches into our parachute, but it also locks us into the cockpit. So it locks us into the seat. So w- when we get in, we've got four points that we that we attach to. There's two on the shoulders, and then there's two down uh, by the waist. And you cinch those down as tight as possible because when you get negative Gs, if those things aren't tight, you could actually go up and you could bang your head off the canopy. So that's like if you're being hung upside down effectively, but in this case, exactly. the way we're turning, it makes that same effect. Okay. So as I was mentioning, we've got the uh, the four connection points on there. Uh, the two that go up to the top, they go into connections that are they're connected to the ejection seat. And the fittings on there are called seawars. And what those do is if they get salt spray on them, uh, that they'll actually uh, disconnect automatically for you. So the point of that being is that if you eject out, you come down, you're incapacitated, you know, you're passed out for some reason, you hit the water, it will automatically release that parachute so it doesn't land on top of you and try to try to drown you. Yeah, and that's what I was about to ask you is that's key because that thing could pull you down uh, underwater. Now, SeaWars, I believe, stands for Seawater Activated Release System. That's correct. Uh, and the idea is it works if it's immersed in the seawater. That's right. Uh, but I actually had one. I'll tell you a quick sea story. I was on the, uh, I don't know if it was John F. Kennedy or my first cruise on the George Washington, but it's been several years. It was a particularly windy day. And, you know, most days at sea are pretty windy. But this day I was out, I was pre flighting my aircraft and it just felt like sandpaper. There was salt all over it. And I didn't think anything of it. I was new and didn't know anything. And I got in and I strapped in the aircraft and we started up and we'll have a whole podcast episode on this later. But uh, I was taxing around. And I'll never forget, I was just by the island, you know, the big superstructure, going the wrong way to get lined up for the catapult. And all of a sudden, I hear this bang, and it sounded like a firecracker or a shotgun blast, and I just froze. I was like, what the bleep was that? And it took me a second to regain my composure in the yellow shirt, which is, again, we'll talk about later, but the guy who's directing you is getting frustrated because I stopped moving, and I'm just you know, a little bit scared. And I finally realized that something felt different. I wasn't like you just said, so strapped in as I usually am. And that Seawars, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that Seawars 
attachment had fired. It did its job, but it did it prematurely because they try to engineer it to not do what it did, but to do it when it's in the water because that's when it needs to function. So needless to say, I got sidelined and didn't get to fly that day, which is a real bummer because we always cherish the day flights. Uh, But I had one go off uh, before it was supposed to, and it was a little bit scary, but uh, it's good to see that they do work because, like you said, if you if you pass out in the ejection and you're floating in the water, this thing could uh, could save your your bacon. That's that's correct. Uh, another story to go with that uh, here at the depot back in the old Tomcat days, uh, we we had a uh, Rio that he's a backseater, radar intercept officer, um, kind of think Goose from Top Gun. So they end up having a high speed ejection. They're doing about 500 knots, and the, the the Rio was the first guy out. And as he hit that that airstream, he ended up damaging his his arms, um, and he ended up becoming incapacitated uh, from the the G forces pushing him up out of the uh, ejection seat. So he passed out, and when he hit the water, he did not have Sea Wars at that time. They they hadn't been fitting them on the uh, the gear yet. They were just new and just coming out. And as he hit the water, he wasn't able to detach his his uh, parachute, and the parachute ended up dragging him down, and he ended up drowning. So oh, wow. that's a case right there where Sea Wars, you know, could have saved somebody's life, right. um, you know, and probably has since then. I, I know a few people, and you probably do as well, have had high speed ejections since then, where they haven't been able to to move on their own mm-hmm. yet their their systems work for them. Hmm. Almost an example, an unfortunate one, but going back to what we said at the beginning of written in blood, I'm sure they expedited the installation after that. At least I certainly hope they did. Yeah, that's that's correct. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the torso harness is what you use to strap into your aircraft. It's not like a car where everything is in the car already. In this case, you're strapping in. And then if you do eject, we uh, you, you pull the parachute out and off you go. Um, okay. Anything else on the harness? Yeah, the uh, the two lower fittings, uh, we talked about the two upper ones and how they attach to the parachute. Um, the two lower fittings will attach you to the seat pan. I believe you're going to have a, a show in the future about that, uh, what the seat pan entails. But uh, the seat pan is basically the, the, the seated part of the ejection seat. And uh, when you when you take the two one, uh, two connectors on the, that are on your lap, it will cinch you down onto it nice and tight. If you do eject, when you come out, the seat pan comes with you. And if you aren't connected there, uh, then you're going to lose your seat pan. Why is that important? What's in the seat pan that we care about? It's got uh, quite a few survival items. Uh, the, basically, the stuff you carry on on board yourself is pretty minimal. There's quite a bit more items that are in the seat pan, which I believe you're going to do a future show on. Uh, well, I don't. I, you know, I already recorded the uh, ejection seat episode, and I'll have to go back and listen and see if we talked about it. To be honest with you, um, but we we can just touch on a couple of them since we're talking survival equipment today. I mean, it's got a uh, it's got a beacon, right? It's got so a they can hold in it on you. Is there some extra water? Is that that one? Extra or? water. You got okay. a raft attached to it. A raft, yeah. Uh, the raft's a big thing, obviously, being out over the water there. Right. So. Okay. Yeah, that's that yeah, is a Yeah, first aid thing. kit in there as well. There's 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 quite a few items. And yeah. our emergency oxygen is also attached to that. So if you don't have your seat pan, you don't have your emergency oxygen. Right. And I should probably remind the audience that we're talking F-18 specifically here. So every aircraft, or at least every ejection seat, it's probably going to be... Let me rephrase that. Every different ejection seat is probably going to have a different seat pan. That's that's true. My understanding with some of the Air Force platforms is that they carry uh, way less on their their survival vest because most of their stuff is in the seat pan, and they they anticipate getting that. You know, I was going to talk about that later, but that's as good a segue as any. The uh, I had a chance to fly the F-16 in my penultimate tour at, up at Fallon, and it was I you know after flying the F-18 for so long, every time I would go out in the gear for the F-16, I felt like I was forgetting something because you basically had your G-suit and everything else you've talked about so far. And then you had a minimal harness with a couple things on it. And that was it. And it just wasn't near as bulky. It was a little more comfortable, but the, yeah, the seat pan was uh, a little bit more equipped in that aircraft in that case. All right. Uh, anything else on the harness? I don't think so. Okay. So then you've got your survival vest, which again, in your case, and mine was as well before I retired, is integrated. So it's just one piece to put on instead of two, but it's basically the same thing. And what's the point now with the survival vest? I mean, the name kind of gives it away. Yeah. I mean, the survival vest is obviously where you got all your survival items. Um, and additionally, it's where they put the uh, the PFC. Uh, they attach that. That's the uh, personal flotation okay. uh, vest. So basically what that does is that that's a, a floating raft um, that's attached to your vest. Not really a raft, but it's it's a flotation device. So um, it's got two, two beaded handles on there. And before you hit the water, uh, ideally, you're going to go ahead and pull those. And they have CO2 cartridges in there, and it's going to blow up a flotation device. So the moment you hit the water, in theory, you already have flotation capability. So if I eject and I'm passed out from whatever, 
theoretically, when I hit the water, my parachute detaches and then my inf- uh, flotation inflates and I could be sitting there bobbing up and down, passed out, but at least I'm breathing air and not water. Exactly. Wow, exactly. that's good. Um, the other thing is when you come down over land, they recommend the uh, the flight equipment specialists to inflate that because it can act, it's a horse collar, so it can act as a buffeting protection for your head. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, it can help stabilize it and also protect you from uh, uh, any kind of trees and limbs sure. and stuff like that. Okay. All right. What else uh, besides the flotation? Well, so we start getting into the uh, the harness itself. It's also a place to attach to your uh, your oxygen regulator and your oxygen mask, um, which is secured onto it. Okay. So the aircraft's going to provide something to what you're wearing. It will regulate it and then deliver it to the pilot. Exactly. Or air crew, I should say. Exactly. And for anybody out there, um, you know, that's that's done any scuba diving before. It's very similar to to breathing from an oxygen tank. Uh, we have the air basically coming at you, and uh, but the only difference is, is rather than having just a piece in your mouth, you have a mask that's completely fitted over your mouth. And then if you leave the airplane, in the case of an ejection, then there's something in the seat that provides a little bit just to get you down. Exactly. Uh, you got about eight mm-hmm. to ten minutes, they say, of uh, emergency oxygen, uh, locks, liquid oxygen that's in there. Uh, and you'll be able to breathe that. So if you have a high altitude ejection, you're going to need that altitude or that oxygen up at that altitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, you may end up passing out and not being able to... Uh, to follow through with your your landing. Okay. All right. So that's what you breathe in. And the uh, mask is also where your microphone is. We'll get to uh, comms here in a bit. Uh, What else? I see you've got a flashlight on here. Uh, You've got some other stuff. What do you got? Yeah. So we got a a flashlight that it's usually on the outside so that you can actually use that for pre-flighting an aircraft at night. Um, It it will usually have a uh, IR um, infrared, infrared yep. a red infrared lens, as well as a red lens for for using at night, and then as well as a white one. Um, Wait, does the flashlight have the infrared, or does the survival strobe? The strobe's got the infrared it as also well, does? Okay. but there should be a infrared light on. Uh, so depends on what flashlight maybe? you have. Okay, but, sure. But that way you can use it for signaling, or if you do have MVGs with you. Night vision goggles. Night so vision if, you, goggles. if you are in an evasion scenario in hostile territory, let's say you need to be able to communicate with the guys coming to get you. And uh, an IR could be useful in the case of the rescue crew at night who's wearing the night vision goggles. That's correct. Because okay. you're not gonna you're not gonna highlight yourself to the enemy yet at the same time. Uh, anybody with goggles will be able to see the, gotcha. uh, the strobe. Okay. What about that big black thing over there? Well, so uh, everybody's um, flight gear, it, you know, in their vest is going to be different from place to place, depending if you're in a fleet going squadron or if you're at the depot. Um, and also you get to put some optional items in there. But one thing that almost everybody carries is a uh, radio. In our case, we carry the, the Prick 149 Alpha. Uh, that's basically the, uh, the government name for it. It's a pretty basic radio. Uh, gives you a two-way UHF, VHF, and also has some GPS capability, but pretty limited. So the idea there is it's pretty basic. It's not a radio like an AM, FM. It's, it's actually transmit and receive. And the idea is if you are delivering an aircraft, let's say, uh, to the East Coast and you go down somewhere in the desert, that you've got a capability to communicate with the rescuers, and uh, but pretty benign in a, I should say, a pretty basic in a benign environment like the domestic, you know, arena. But when we go overseas, then they may put something different in there, correct? That That's correct. And so for the most of the flying we do out here, you know, at times we're, we're 100 miles out at sea uh, doing a test flight on, on an aircraft that may not have flown for a while. Um, ejection scenario out there, I tell you, that, that radio is the number one thing you want to have working because you want to be able to give get that uh, emergency call out, tell them where you are, get that GPS going. And then it also has a beacon on there that uh, pretty much any aircraft would pick up. So they can home in on it. Yeah. I, you know, I might debate that with you, uh, Vern. I might say flotation might be. Well, let's assume that you're still floating. <laughs> okay. All right. You got me there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we've got some signaling devices, if you will. We've got communication devices. Uh, well, actually, yeah. What else have you got for signaling? Yeah. So for, for signaling, um, we've got a, uh, it's a Mark 124 motto is what they call it, but uh, it's the That's same. That's just the nomenclature. That's the right? nomenclature, but it's, it's, it's the same flare that um, uh, we've, we've had. Not flare, but a smoke signal uh, that, that we've had probably going back to the Vietnam War. So you got one side here that's a, a daytime one, um, and it's going to be a little bit more of a, a bright red. Uh, and then you have actually the, the daytime. I think is smoke more, isn't it? Oh, smoke rather. You're right. Okay. You're right. Yeah. Sorry, then, don't uh, mean to call you out in front of yeah, everyone. No, no. Make sure we I'm want to make sure we're getting the good here. information. Okay. So then, uh, then the nighttime you got more of the the red red one there. Gotcha. So for helping the signal at night. Now this is still mandatory for all the uh, all the equipment to. Uh, or all the uh, vests to have in it is the uh, the smoke flare for both day and night, which is basically one item. Uh, another item that we have is the pencil flare. 
um, going back to my, my dad, I mean, I remember him being a, as an F4 pilot, um, always, you know, he, they had those back in the day and it was mandatory, uh, equipment, but they've actually pulled that back to being optional now. But I can tell you, you know, if we're out there at hundred miles at sea, I want to have a pencil flare because the pencil flares actually get up and they shoot, you know, probably about 150 feet in the air, I would say. Uh, you know, I should probably have researched that. I don't recall, but it's basically a bottle rocket. Yeah, exactly. And you got seven of them, and they they got pretty good hang time on them too. It's a bright red um, flare that will go up, and and it, it's probably got a pretty good shot of of being seen by a passing by ship. Where you know, a, if you're down on the surface and you got a little bit of a red uh, flare going, I don't know how well that's really going to help you out. Right. I remember in training, you probably do too. They always made a big deal about don't shoot it at the survival aircraft. That's true. <laughs> shoot it <laughs> perpendicular so they can yeah. see it. They don't want to yeah, see a it. It looks just like in. a tracer coming at them. <laughs> Excellent. All right, signaling, communication. Yeah, so we've got a, a signal mirror in here as well. It, they've, they've changed over the years a little bit. This one looks like it's a plastic one where the one of my dad's era was a uh, more of a, a metal uh, mirrored type of glass. So it's probably a little bit more durable. But yeah, basically what you do with this one is daytime only, and you're going to look through the center of it, and you're going to uh, use the sun's light, and you're going to refract that. And you're basically going to go back and forth across a possible aircraft that's coming your way or a ship, and you can signal them with the light. Right. I was watch, flipping through the channels the other day, and there was some survival show, a bear or somebody, Grillis or whatever, and he was talking about how that can be visible up to you know 10 miles away, and that's just a reflection of the sun. So that's a really low-tech, simple, but highly effective uh, signaling device. Yeah, it, I mean, there's uh, actually there's operating instructions on here. Number four <laughs> says to continually sweep the horizon even if no one is in sight because mm. uh, the, the Somebody signal can, can be see seen for many miles, even in hazy weather. So right. it, it's hmm. a lot more effective than I, I think we think it is. Yeah, okay. Uh, other items in here got a uh, very old school looking. Uh, it's probably straight out of the Vietnam War. Right I here. think that's straight out of a Cracker Jack box. What is that thing? <laughs> it's a it's, it's a an old wrist compass. compass. Yeah, it's okay. an old wrist compass. Uh, but it looks like it works. Yeah, basic um, is good in the survival situation. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, they got a compass basically for for doing some kind of land navigation. Okay. And then you've got your uh, water bottle in here, and I hope this thing's been changed out recently, but probably not. Um, do you happen to recall how often the PRs are Oh, gosh, it's to... some periodicity. I don't yeah. know, 30 or 60 days. It's, but it's yeah, not good, whatever if you, it is. If you mess with the PRs, and that's the parachute riggers, the people who take care of our gear, then they're liable to put something in there that <laughs> you don't want. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, you want to treat the... You always want to treat people right, but specifically when they have your life and uh, comfort in your hands. Yep. And the big okay. thing to realize is that it's it's really not much water. Uh, I mean, this thing's no bigger than than about half of my palm. So Looks like it's, about it's just enough ounces. water to, to make you thirsty, I think. <laughs> um, all right. See, outside of that, um, I think that's about all the gear I have in okay. here. Yep. Oh, and actually, we do have the strobe. We talked a little bit about that. Right. There is a uh, uh, a strobe in here that can be set for an IR setting, and then it also has a, a blue light on it. Okay. Um, and something that they tell you about in combat is just making sure that when that thing goes off, it can look like a rifle flash. So, right. So uh, making sure that you uh, use the blue strobe if uh, if you're in that kind of scenario. And it's got a little Velcro patch on it, right? So yeah, what do so you, you can place you that right on top of your head. Oh, okay, so it frees up your hands, and you've got a beacon on your head. Uh, yep. In the and that's another thing to note is that uh, the poor PRs, uh, they do a great job with it. But um, any every single item that's in here, because we're in the water, we're, we're floating in a raft, hopefully. Uh, if we drop something because we have cold cold hands, we lose our dexterity, um, that thing's going to the bottom of the ocean. So everything in here is is perfectly uh, tied in with a uh, lanyard to it. So it's all, all attached to the survival vest some, itself. Some sort of uh, serious looking little parachute cord type stuff that looks like it's pretty strong and they tie in real nice knots and it keeps everything tied in. Okay. Exactly. Excellent. Now, are you allowed to carry anything of your own? Yeah, you, um, you're allowed to have, I, I can't remember exactly. Like five pounds, is I it thought five, it used to be. Is it that much? Okay. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, five, five pounds of uh, extra gear. Um, so uh, maybe a wool cap if it's cold where you're going. Exactly. Extra um, water. One thing we used to carry was we had, we had a little, uh, it looked like a sardine can, and the whole squadron had bought them. And so we had these things, and we used these for, um, you know, just in case we're out there for a long time. But it, it's basically got a, a mini survival kit inside of this little thing. So oh, cool. it was something extra that was easy to bring along. Fish hooks maybe or something. Exactly. Cool. Anything else on the survival vest? No, I think that just about sums it up. Okay, well, let's see. We're almost fully clothed here. Uh, what do we put on our heads? 
Well, we've got a uh, a helmet that they issued to us. They put a uh, reflective tape on it. Um, that's something that the Navy does, basically, so they can see us bobbing around on the water at night. Okay. Uh, if we end up in there, it's got a visor uh, that comes down to protect us from the uh, the UV rays up at altitude. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got two uh, two attachments on the side, so you can secure your oxygen mask to it. Okay. Uh, that will maintain on there during ejection. And then inside the helmet, we've got uh, a set of um, uh, earphones. And that basically is used to to listen to what's going on on the radios. Also, if you're flying in a two seat Hornet, uh, if you have a Wizzo in the back seat, weapon system officer, uh, you guys communicate back and forth uh, through the intercom system, ICS, and that's where you're going to hear what what's going on with that. Um, there's also what's called a pigtail, and that goes from the helmet down to your mask, and inside your mask is where your microphone's at. And that's how you um, have your communications go outbound. Okay, so speak through the microphone, listen through the headsets in the helmet there. Yep, okay. you got it. And it's got a chin strap, which is, yeah, I don't yeah, know, probably good worthless. enough, I guess. I guess they are <laughs> Probably been, the first thing coming off in an ejection. Yeah, unfortunately. So they're coming up with a better system. Now, in some aircraft, you actually have a helmet-mounted sight of some sort. That's correct. The uh, JHMCS, the Joint Helmet Mounted Queuing System, uh, is pretty much fleet standard now uh, for the guys for the daytime. And it gives you uh, queuing for your sensors. So you can you can queue your um, your FLIR, and you can also queue your air-to-air weapons and sensors uh, utilizing it. So it gives you a pretty good essay of what's going on around you. Uh, and also gives you a lot more target acquisition capability. Uh, but it, it is a little bit heavier um, and causes a little more neck strain. Yeah. So SA being situational awareness, yep. and uh, I think you said something else in there, but I'll have to listen later and decipher. No problem. Again, this is our world, not there, so we're trying to spell it out. Um, so essentially, you're getting uh, a, some video or useful information projected right there, and so if you look from left to right, it's all still right there instead of the traditional way is that our heads-up display as part of the aircraft is only straight ahead. So That's no matter which way you look, but like you said, there's a little bit of strain. All right, and then uh, what about at night? What else can we do with a helmet? Well, so the DHMCS we were talking about is primarily during the daytime. Um, they're working on a nighttime mod uh, to integrate it. Uh, but at least in our day, um, we would have to go back to the old helmet, like the one we're looking at right here. Mm-hmm. It's got two uh, mounts that they they put up on the uh, the top side of it. Just kind so, of at your hairline almost uh, exact, for some of us. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so basically a mount goes in there, and that's where your night vision goggles are in night vision devices. Uh, mm-hmm. They end up uh, mounting on there, and you use those. So in the fleet, uh, when you're flying an F-18 at nighttime, you pretty much always have goggles, and you're using those uh, except for during takeoff and landing. Yeah, so they're not always on, but once you're done with the administrative transitions from the ground to the air and back, exactly. you know, uh, then you put those on. And, yeah, and what, What's remember, the idea there? I mean, it just kind of turns night and a day a little bit? Pretty much. I mean, it depends on how the moon is and everything, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah I mean, lighting. You're, you'll go out on a pitch black night and you won't be able to see anything even with your uh, night eyesight adapted mm-hmm. uh, after a certain amount of time, but you put on a pair of goggles and you can see the mountains around you, you can yeah. see everything. But everything's in shades of green. People have probably seen seen it on the news or oh, something, yeah. but oh, it's yeah. shades of green. You don't get real good depth perception, right? No, there's there's really uh, no depth perception the way you're looking through it. And then the other thing is, is that the stars look just like your wingman who's flying next to you with his lights on. So, uh, you know, it's, except it's for still the flashing hard. part of it. But yeah, exactly. people have tried to rendezvous, if you will, on stars yep. and it doesn't usually work out too well. Um, let's see, what else was it going to say? They also don't, uh, that's what it was. They also don't help your vision very much. Or I should say, if you're 20, 20 in the daytime, which I think most fighter pilots probably are with the night vision goggles, you're degraded quite a bit, are you not? Uh, yeah, I believe so. I don't remember exactly what the degradation is, but it, it it's definitely not as sure. Well, yeah, you wouldn't expect to be, I suppose, with a system like that with exactly. all the lenses and the illumination. All right, anything else on the helmet? Yeah, one, one cool thing about it is that, uh, you know, I, I think everybody out there really likes to see uh, the insignias and everything that the, the squadrons have. But uh, the neat thing about the, the helmets, and especially the Navy, is that each squadron on the back of them, they'll usually put the, uh, the pilot's call sign, and then they'll put the uh, the emblem for that squadron. Right. So they're kind of like little trophies uh, if you get to keep one from from when you were a younger pilot. Yeah, I, have, I think I have one or at least uh, maybe two. I don't know at home. But, yeah, they're pretty cool. I guess people are probably familiar with, you know, sports teams, helmets, football, for example. You exactly. Know, the Seahawks like have that. got a big Seahawk on the side of there. So we have similar. But like you said, you have to have so much of that reflective tape because if you're bobbing in the water, in my previous example, everything worked and you're unconscious, you can't signal these guys as possible with the right conditions. They'll see you just from that reflection. That's correct. But, I think it has to be at least 90% reflective, if right. I remember correctly. But on the other hand, that's an awfully big, big ocean. Uh, if you're out in the middle of it, that small little pinhead, and, uh, not in my case, my head's kind of big. But for some people, uh, I mean, 
mean literally, not fit. Well, I guess both. Uh, anyway, where am I going with this? Um, so it's it's tough, but hopefully you'll get found uh, if that's the if if that's what you've got. All right. Uh, what else? I guess just maybe gloves, right? Yeah. So the uh, the gloves that we wear, um, there's a few different new models that have come out over the last few years, but for the most part, they're all made of the same Nomex material uh, that the flight suits are. Uh, they're a little more more stretchy material, but mm. they're they're uh, designed to be fireproof. And I remember going back to my T2 days, you know, dating myself there a little bit, but uh, going through uh, jet training back in Meridian, Mississippi, and there was a flight instructor there who told everybody the story about make sure you wear your gloves because he'd, he'd pull out his uh, his hands and you could see where they got all burnt up. From what? From not wearing uh, gloves and, and having a fire in the cockpit. Oh, a fire, uh, okay. Or an ejection, rather. Oh, was it yeah, an ejection? I think it was an ejection, but it was a fire in the cockpit. As it as the ejection seat fired, he ended up uh, burning his hands pretty uh, bad. So. He was passing that on to us about how important that is. Sure. And I guess um, it used to be that the gloves were fully fingered, if you will, and then we would all cut our fingertips off the gloves because it gave you better dexterity for the touch screens and the various things where you needed that tactile feel. And then right before I retired, a couple of years before, they finally came out with authorized, if you will, uh, fingerless gloves where just the tips were off. So that helped with the fine that, That's correct. Fine yeah, they skills. do have those now. All right, so at that point you're you're ready to rock, right? Yeah. Anything yeah. else? Uh, what if, so that's pretty much all missions. What if we're overseas and we're flying over uh, some place that's maybe not as friendly as uh, as the desert in my previous example? What, anything else or extra we're carrying in that situation? Well, I mean, there, there's certain areas in the world you may fly with a with a sidearm, um, you know, for for okay, a uh, pistol, basically. Exactly. Um, and then there's a few other things that, uh, they, they may have you carry for, to help with, with, uh, recovery just in case you, you end up in a hostile area. Okay. So if you either crash or get shot down or something else, you've got a few devices at your use there to, uh, affect a recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The movie behind enemy lines pretty much, I think covered every single one of those okay. items. <laughs> well, we'll leave it at that in the, uh, in the interest of not saying something maybe we shouldn't. Exactly. All right. Outstanding. All right, Vern. Well, that, I think, is flight gear. Uh, anything else I'm missing on that? I don't believe so. Excellent. I think you got, got it all. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to stop tape here and take a little video so people can see it, and we'll just throw that on YouTube. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, but before we go, we've got a little tradition here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast of asking our guests to explain their call sign. Now, yours is, uh, it sounds like a... a just a shortening of your name, but uh, I don't know. Tell us about your experience with the call signs uh, as a young pilot. Well, the one I ended up with is pretty boring. It's uh, just play off the name, uh, Vern, last name Vern Alice. So it kind of goes back to the old Ernest movies, you know, as, as horrible as those yeah, are. Yeah. But the whole Hey Vern thing. So it, it actually was Hey Vern, and then it became Vern. And there's people that only know me as Vern, and there's people who know me as Aaron, you know. But yeah. it's it's kind of set that way. But uh, probably the best call sign I ever had that, that uh, didn't stick was Daddy Daycare. And I got that one <laughs> back when uh, my son, Jesse, was uh, about six months old. And I walk into the officer club in Lemoore. I got him in one hand with a beer in that same hand. <laughs> and I'm playing shuffleboard with the other. And my skipper comes in and goes, what is this, a Daddy Daycare? That's so, a sure way if the skipper, the commanding officer, as he's also known, uh, if exactly. he says something like that, that usually yep. helps. Yep, so it, it went up on the board and uh, became Daddy Daycare, but Daddy Daycare just didn't roll off the tongue quite as much as Vern did. So, you know, it ended up going, kind of reverting back to Vern. Uh, yeah. A few others, you know, got in there and tried to embrace him, and uh, everybody kind of just went back to Vern. So It's yeah. almost like, uh, it's you know everything kind of comes back to what it's supposed to be or meant yeah. to be and it seems yeah. like you know kind of like a marble will always roll to the bottom I, of the I bowl. think the big thing is I didn't have anything that I ever hated enough for it to stick so. <laughs> we talk about that in episode <laughs> you, you should have listened to it before we recorded yeah. but yeah um, Ferg ends up talking about that so outstanding well good and I'm glad it's not something else like you know Bam Bam or, you know, Skids or any of these others where Baja, you know, the guy yeah, who goes we'd, off we'd have to off change the, the rating on it to be able to talk about it. Yeah, true, true, <laughs> true. Okay. Excellent. All right, Vern, uh, what's what's the future hold for you, buddy? Well, uh, i got about a year and a half to retirement and then probably looking to uh, to follow your shoes there and to the airlines, you know. Excellent. Well, keep, keep myself in the air flying around and um, hopefully uh, – Pick, pick a, uh, a few of these people that are listening to the podcast on a flight someday. Excellent. Well, uh, give me a shout. I'll be happy to give you what little information uh, I retained hey, from the process. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, the airlines are hiring, so I, I think they'll grab you. You're a great dude, and I uh, really enjoyed your friendship. So thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, sir. And uh, we'll see you around. Yeah, appreciate it, Joe. All right. Let's get out of here. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Once again, that was Lieutenant Commander Aaron Vernalis joining me to talk flight gear. 
And I just want to cover a few more things in listening to it that I think could be useful for you. Number one, tan flight suits. You still will see those here domestically in the United States. The adversary squadrons will use those from time to time, especially in the desert areas like uh, Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas and up in Fallon near Reno, both in Nevada. Uh, and then other squadrons from time to time will wear those. And then on the Sea Wars story that I told you about, uh, just two quick things. So when I said I was going the wrong direction, you know, again, we'll have a show on carrier operations, but they have to shuffle all the aircraft around and, and, and move them to get lined up behind the aircraft, correction, behind the catapult. So in that case, I was, I was heading aft on the ship or backwards and just waiting my turn to turn around and get on the catapult. And then also, it probably was understood by the listener, but just in case it wasn't, you know, when I said I was pre-flighting the aircraft and it felt salty, you know, the, the canopies will be raised on the aircraft most of the time. And so if it's salty and windy out, then that salt will get on everything, not just the exterior of the aircraft. So uh, I implied there, hopefully you understood, that it also landed on those Seawars fittings and then one fired prematurely. Uh, the pencil flare had a slight misspeak. I'm sure you didn't catch it, but I'll point it out anyway. I said something about firing it at the uh, survival aircraft. I meant to say the rescue aircraft, but uh, that's just the, whoever it is coming to get you. Uh, your survival aircraft is probably at the bottom of the uh, ocean in that example. And then finally, you know, listening to myself, um, as I said before, I'm, I have a newfound respect for radio and, for that matter, television, who have to also be seen, uh, announcers and hosts. Uh, this isn't easy, and uh, I'm, I'm trying. I hope I'm getting better. Um, but the one thing I noticed when I listened to that is I said nothing, because I was thinking, frankly, uh, in the beginning, and then a couple times later when Vern was talking about his father. Um, I later found out in talking to Vern in the preparation for this episode that he passed away in 2004 due to cancer. And uh, I never told Vern, thank you for your dad's service. Uh, so I'll do that publicly here. And, you know, another thing is, uh, boy, talk about embodying the fighter pilot spirit. You know, Vern, as a young man, really didn't know that much about his father until after he passed away and Vern had a chance to look through and found out that he had done three Vietnam cruises, did uh, 300 combat missions over Vietnam, and was awarded 22 air medals um, and was one of the initial cadre of Top Gun when it formed in 1969. He was also a commanding officer of a squadron and retired as the skipper of the base there in Point Magoo. And so, boy, what a testimony to uh, a real patriot, a fine American, and uh, Vern, uh, on behalf of the whole audience, thank you to your family uh, for your father's service. Um, uh, just nothing but respect and reverence for the gentleman. All right. Well, I think that is going to wrap up episode three. As before, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. I want to thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. If you got a question for the show, you can send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MOCK-101. That's 877-622-4101. Now be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Please like, follow, share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So that'll do it for episode three. Tune back in in another 10 days or so when we should be talking ejection seats. Until then, take it easy. <laughs>